Yeah, me kind of. Who said that? Good. Oh, the rain. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're here amongst us today. And uh, we pray that we just feel a touch of your love and presence throughout this time of life. May you speak to our hearts. Thank you that we can worship you. As we worship you, we just connect and receive the Spirit into such a special, special way. May we continue that way every day. Speak to us and heal our hearts. Today we pray. Amen. So, um, watching the news at the moment is especially grim, isn't it? We are seeing the worst of humanity. But against this backdrop, we're also seeing the best of humanity. We're seeing homes and countries welcome in refugees. We're seeing millions of pounds being raised for those in need. We're seeing remarkable acts of bravery and sacrifice. And this contrast, good, bad, uh, light, darkness, is echoed, I feel, to an extent in two, the two books that we're just about to approach in our walk through the Bible, and that's Judges and Ruth. The end of Judges, the last verse is this, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did as he saw fit, and the result was utter devastation and chaos. And that refrain is repeated throughout the book, people just did what they thought was right, and suffering, pain, chaos, pain. <laughs> then you switch the page to the book of Ruth, and the first words, in the days when the judges ruled, so immediately we've got context. What we're read, about to read is in the midst of this dark period of, ju of Judges. And if you've just come across Ruth, you might think, oh no, what's coming next? <laughs> I've read Judges, what's coming next? But what follows is a beautiful story. Highlights and virtues such as kindness, loyalty, faithfulness. And it's for that reason that Ruth stands as a favoured book of many of us, I'm sure people here today as well. And the story itself, it's, um, it's fairly brief, fairly straightforward, some lovely moments in it. And although the book is called Ruth, it's actually more centred around Naomi, Ruth's uh, mother-in-law. And we get an introduction into Naomi's life in the opening few verses. So her family is from Bethlehem, and because of a famine in the land, they go to neighbouring Moab uh, so that they can survive, so they can get food. But there, Tragedy upon tragedy falls her. She loses her husband and her two sons. And not only does she have to, to deal with grief of losing these loved ones, she also faces a highly uncertain future because she doesn't have any grandchildren. So her own future is in doubt. Who will look after her in her old age? But not only that, who will maintain and perpetuate the family name, which was such a big issue for Israelites back at this time? <clears throat> so she, Naomi, is in Moab for a period of 10 years, and she hears that there's food in Bethlehem and makes plans to return home. And she says to her two daughters-in-law, uh, Orpah and Ruth, look, you stay here. It is better for your future and your well-being. You remain. Let me go alone. And Orpah stays, but Ruth says, no, I'm going <coughs> with you. And it's a remarkable act of loyalty, all the more so that, given that Ruth, um, Ruth would go back as a widow and a foreigner. She'd been very vulnerable, but because of her loyalty to Naomi, she goes with her. And so they get home, and so they go to Bethlehem, and Ruth, she begins to glean in a nearby field to get some food. Now, if you remember, you might remember from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, one of the requirements of the law was that during the harvest, farmers shouldn't pick up all of the remains from the harvest, and so that the poor could come and pick up and glean from it. Um, it. And that is what Ruth was doing. And the farm that she happened to be gleaning on was owned by a chap called Boaz. And Boaz takes a bit of a shine to Ruth, uh, looks out for her, provides for her and Naomi. And it transpires that Boaz is a distant relative of Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband. And 
Fast forward in the story, he ends up becoming the family's kinsman redeemer. And effectively what that means is that he takes ownership of Naomi's family's estate to secure their future, uh, so Naomi should be provided for in her old age, and it will perpetuate uh, Elimelech's family's name. Now as part of this, and again as part of uh, the Levitical law, it meant that Boaz had to marry Ruth, and I'm sure that, that was, he was good with that, I think he took a bit of shine to her anyway. Uh, so from Naomi's perspective, uh, the future is looking a lot brighter. But from Boaz's perspective, what he did was, yes, you know, that there, there were many blessings in this world, but it was actually a costly move on from his perspective. Because the family name of Elimelech would take precedence over his, so it endangered his very estate. And that's why a closer relative to Elimelech could have taken on that kinsman redeemer role, but he didn't because it was costly, it would endanger his own estate. So that's why Boaz, it's an act of kindness on his behalf. So Boaz and Ruth, they get married and they have a child by the name Obed, who is the grandfather of the second King David, and then we carry the line forward and we get to Jesus. So that's where Ruth fits in the broader picture of the Bible. Now I'd like to look at a couple of two very brief things <coughs> about Naomi, uh, which I hope will be helpful for us today, and that's recognition and redemption. Recognition and redemption. So the first, recognition. Naomi recognised the sovereignty of God in the good things in her life and the bad things in her life. Mm. Chapter 2, verse 20, which is the direct midpoint of the whole story, says this. So this is when uh, Naomi realises that Boaz is a relative. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness for the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative, he is one of our kinsmen, redeemers. So this is the turning point of the story, where hope really begins to shine, right bang in the middle. And it's a cause of celebration for Naomi, and she recognises the sovereignty of God in it. But when things were tough for her, she also recognised the sovereignty of God in her life. If we rewind very briefly to chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went to a fault, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me, but the Almighty has brought this fortune upon me. Now we don't know the circumstances around the deaths of her husband and two children. Spiritually, we don't know what was going on there. But what we can pick up from here is that Naomi recognised that it was under the sovereign care of God. That it wasn't outside of what happened, wasn't outside of his control. And the wording that she uses here is really instructive for us. Notice the four references to God. It's, there's a, there's some, uh, a symmetry to it. So we have Almighty, Lord, Lord, Almighty. Almighty, Lord, Lord, Almighty. And this pattern of symmetry is repeated elsewhere in the book, and I'll touch upon that briefly in just a moment. But the word, the Hebrew word for Almighty is Shaddai. And, an, and an, uh, a reference to this is mountain, indicates sort of steadfastness, strength, that kind of thing. But what's more interesting is that God Almighty Shaddai is used elsewhere in the Pentateuch. And it gives us a hint as to Naomi seeing hope in her eyes. So Genesis chapter 17, God appears to 99 year old Abraham. And says, I am God Almighty, Shaddai, and I am going to bless and multiply your family. Sovereignty of God, but there's implicit hope in that. Fast forward to Jacob in Genesis chapter 43. Uh, his sons have just returned from Egypt, and they said, Look, we need to take Benjamin back with us. That's what, the, the, that's what Joseph was requiring in Egypt. But uh, Jacob was reluctant because like, Benjamin was his other favourite son. But he, he let, let him go and said, and may, the God, may God Almighty, Shaddai, give you mercy as you go on your way. So it's an implicit, it's recognising the sovereignty of God, but there's an implicit hope in it. And we see it again in Genesis, when Jacob 
is blessing all of his sons. And he gets to Joseph. And he acknowledges the suffering that Joseph has gone through. And he says, may God Almighty bless you. Shall I? So there's a recognition of God's sovereignty, God Almighty, that there is hope amidst it. And so when Naomi is there, it's a recognition that God is in control, but I have trust in God's character that hope is on the way. And if we look throughout the whole book, Naomi knew God was kind. She mentions it on a couple of occasions. Kindness is a theme throughout this story. She knew that there was redemption along the way. And that brings me on to my second point. Jump to chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. What a lovely end to the story. And to touch upon the pattern of symmetry throughout this book, this closing uh, paragraph, chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, mirrors chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Both of them in the Hebrew are 71 words. So this opening bit we get an introduction to Naomi's story. And it's a tragedy. Jump forward to the end of the story. The same amount of words. And it's blessing, it's fullness, it's redemption. And what's the midpoint of the story? Chapter 2, verse 20. God does not stop showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That turning point in the story where everything shifts towards hope. And we see this contrast of living and dead. And it's a contrast of symmetry that we see in other parts of, the, of this book as well. Naomi, she says, call me Mara. As she gets back to Bethlehem and people can see that, she's, she, that they've come back, they're wondering what's gone, and she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because it means bitter. Naomi, her name means pleasant. So you have bitterness, bitter taste. Pleasant, pleasant taste. And what's the name that we are, we are left with more than anything else from her? It is Naomi, it's not Mara. Pleasant sweetness brings the dead. And then in her life, sort of more practically, we see a wonderful contrast in the way that the Naomi was at the beginning and, the, and what Naomi ends up with at the end. Chapter 1, we're told that the Lord has brought her back empty. Jump to the end. And just thinking about the wording. Redeemed, renewed, sustained. Naomi is full. And this theme of redemption, it's throughout the whole of Ruth. The, the, the word or variations of the term redemption is used, is used 23 times. In this story. I think God's trying to get a message across here. Now Naomi didn't get her husband back. Naomi did not get her sons back. And there would still be moments, even as she just celebrated this new chapter in her life, where she would greatly miss her loved ones. But there was reason for praise. There was reason for thankfulness. There was beauty from the ashes. There was redemption. There was a redemption story. And how amazing that this then fits into the broader narrative of Scripture, given that her story links to Jesus. And so, friends, where in our lives do we need to recognise the God, recognise God's sovereignty and providence, not only in our celebrations, but also our suffering? And from that, hold on to redemption. And know that suffering is not the end of the story. It's, that's not the last chapter. That's not the full stop. There is redemption. 
there is hope. And we might not know what that looks like. It might not be initially what we want. And it may not come where we want. But every single story of our suffering, every story of setback, and every storm that we go through, there is a redemption story for you. Because God is in the midst of it. God is involved. And one of the main reasons why Ruth is in the book of the, book of the Bible is because God wants to get this across to us. The name is story of suffering and redemption. It can also be our story of suffering and redemption too. And if we look at that ultimate story of redemption, Jesus Christ. Good Friday, Jesus was nailed to the cross. Darkness descended. It was like evil and sin had the last word. Saturday comes, silence, what's going on? Questions, doubts. Sunday comes, resurrection. Light breaks through, sin overcome, death beaten. Jesus, the victor. That's the ultimate story of redemption which we all share in today. But it's also one that plays out in our everyday lives in the difficulties that we go through. To trust God's hand in your life. His kindness in your life. Look forward to the beauty rising from the ashes. Trust in him. And know that there is a redemption story waiting for you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful short story uh, in the Old Testament. And it, in, at the time of the judges, this, this story was the, the light of the dark. And we pray that this story would be a light in our darkness today as well. And whatever if it, we're going through right now, which is really tough, help us to trust in your son, to know that it's under your care and kindness, and that a redemption story awaits. So give us hope, give us trust, give us faith. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.